<laughs> Today's topic really isn't about taxi service in Calgary, all right? Today's topic is about shared platforms and how they are going to impact the future of work. My name is Lauren Falkenberg, and I'm the Associate Dean Research at the Haskane School of Business. Ramit Carr is the general manager in Alber Alberta for Uber. Our researcher is Peter. He's uh, an, a professor in the Haskane School of Business. His research areas are the uh, impact of technology on work and strategic human resource management. Peter, um, I know that you did some research on taxi in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I wonder if you could tell us about what you learned about contingent workforces and flexible work arrangements. Sure. Um, so in, in the 90s, um, there was a lot of interest in how work is changing, and there was all this sort of um, buzz about contingent workforce, sort of like we hear now with gig economy and so forth. Um, and that the, the, the way people were, 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 was, that were working was changing. Um, so you heard a lot about alternative work arrangements and contingent labor forces. And so um, uh, in my role as an academic, I was trying to conceptualize it. So what's really going on? And I came up with something uh, that I call the organization and labor relationship uh, framework. And I was trying to think uh, fundamentally how how people work in organizations. And you know, sort of the standard way people work is that they're in an employment relationship, you know, the typical way we think of work, where you're working 40 hours a week and so forth. And, um, and you have a boss, and within a feasible set of activities, a boss can tell you what to do. And so that, that's one way that we think of work. Uh, another way we think of work is ownership relationships, where uh, and I know uh, there's some folks from a law firm here where you have people who are partners in, a, in, in an organization, and as a result, they take part in the governance of it and so forth. And, and kind of the third way that people work in organizations is uh, what I refer to as contracting in relationships. In town, we know people who are independent contractors and um, quote unquote consultants and so forth working in organizations. Well, I've studied these in a variety of different contexts, uh, but one of the contexts I was interested in was, was taxicab organizations, because taxicab organizations have all three of these, of, of these different kind of relationships. And, and when I was looking at it in, in, in the, the 90s, and I had some old data, uh, usually a cab company had one or the other kind of model. It used one of these relationships or another. The other little factor was I knew a little bit about the taxi cab uh, industry because uh, I was from New York City and we take a lot of cabs and my grandfather owned a cab. Had a small fleet once, I was told, lost it, well, you know. Um, but, but I understood something about this industry. And what you saw in this industry was that when the cabs used employment relationships where people were paid an hourly wage or a commission, uh, that typically gave you some greater predictability. Uh, so for example, you could uh, say, hey, pick up my kids at a certain time of the day, and you'd be assured of that. When they were in a contracting in relationship, which is essentially where they leased the cab, uh, all bets were off. Uh, it was much less predictable uh, what you could expect out of a cab. So you know, I, I think back about that time, and I think back of my cab companies and um, what they were capable of doing. And uh, this summer, um, I was at a friend's house in Philadelphia, and I said, I gotta take a cab to, over to uh, the university. And he said, don't bother with a cab. He said, take Uber. I said, I don't have the app. And he said, oh, I'll, I'll pay for it. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> um, but I, you know, so, he said, I'll call, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get you a, uh, a driver through Uber, I'll get you Uber. And it was, you know, so quick and so seamless, um, the experience. Um, I didn't have to sit there and haggle and we were talking about what the tip was and so forth. 
And for me, it, it, it made me think back of my cabs and really how primitive the technology was, which essentially had a meter. Um, the cab put the, uh, the cabbie put the meter on or off. And you had the dispatcher. And the, essentially, the dispatcher was, hey, Peter, you know, as, as if I were the driver, where are you now? Um, as opposed to what Uber had. So when I think of, uh, of Uber, um, I think of the promise of the future. I think of a future where, uh, as we'll get into in the conversation, and Ramit can speak much more to than me, I think of a future where we think of uh, a really a, a market with great efficiency, where you as a rider uh, are getting that cab really, uh, pardon me, getting that, that Uber ride, I'm using the cab language, sorry, uh, getting the Uber ride so quickly, so seamlessly, and on the driver's side, you know, the, the big thing for a cab driver is the, 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 the downtime, and just sitting around waiting, and even worse, uh, cruising around and, 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 and using lots of gas. Uber has this capacity to, to minimize those, those coordination issues so much more than the technology of the past, and I think that's really tremendous promise that it offers us. Okay, so um, I'm not sure how many people in the room are like me, but I could really benefit from Uber for dummies, all right? <laughs> and this is really about what is a shared platform so that as we move forward and talk about its impact on work, what truly is a shared platform and how does it manage and control just-in-time delivery? So, so I'm happy to uh, give, give everyone an Uber 101. It's, it's helpful for me to just understand uh, the level set of the crowd here. Uh, just if, by, by way of showing your hands up, how many people have taken an Uber here before? Wow, OK. So we're probably at about 80%, I'm going to guess. Um, next question is, how many people are familiar with what a shared platform is? OK, that's a little bit less, but still, OK. OK, so I'll, I'll, for, for those of you that haven't taken an Uber, or even those of you that have taken an Uber, I'll just level set on uh, the, basically what Uber's all about. And so really, it all started one snowy night in Paris back in 2008. And so this was about a year after the iPhone uh, was launched. There's two friends there that uh, were at a conference in Paris. It was the Le Web conference. Uh, it was snowing. They got out from the conference activities. And they were trying to get a ride home. Uh, they were trying to flag down a cab in Paris. The cabs just kept driving by. They were all full. The two friends that you actually see on, on the screens right here, on the left is Garrett Camp, who is a Calgarian U of C grad. On the right is Travis Kalanick. Travis Kalanick is our current CEO. Uh, so these two friends were, were trying to get a, that cab in, in Paris. And nobody would stop for them. And Garrett literally had the idea to, to Travis saying, wouldn't it be great if we could pull, pull open our phone, push a button, and a ride were to magically appear? And so that, that's really the kernel of where that idea started back in 2008. Now, they took that idea back to San Francisco. They worked on it for, for a while. We got founded in 2010, and now, uh, you know, now it started to skyrocket. And so really, it, it, became, it, was, it was a very simple idea at first to say, wouldn't it be awesome if you just opened up your phone and a car were to just show up shortly after? So I'll, I'll go very quickly into uh, the different service offerings that we have right now. And so when we, when we first started, Garrett and Travis started something called Uber Black. Uber Black historically has been kind of more of a luxury product. So these are licensed limousine drivers. This is your Lincoln Town cars and, th and things like that. Now the reason why you hear about Uber so often and so much is mostly because of UberX. UberX is what we call ride sharing. Ride sharing is citizens driving citizens around town. Uh, when you open up the app in certain cities and you select UberX on, on the app, you're, you're going to get something like a Honda Civic or a Toyota Prius or something like that. Generally speaking, with ride-sharing products, it's going to be anywhere from 30 to 40% cheaper than regular taxi alternatives. There's other options out there as well, Uber XL. So if you happen to be in a larger group, let's say of six or seven people, you can get a minivan or a larger SUV to get to that same place. And there's Uber Select, which is still a ride-sharing version where it's citizens helping citizens out, but it's more of a premium product. So if you're going on a date or if you're wanting to impress someone, you know, you can be in a you can show up in a BMW or a Lexus or, or something like that. 
So, you know, so those are, those are the service offerings. I mean, a, a large part of what has made Uber Uber is, is the experience that, that we've, uh, we've brought to the marketplace. And so I'll go into that in just a second. So, so really, if you were to distill down the experience into three pieces, it's order, ride, and leave. So I mentioned Travis and Garrett's first uh, interaction of saying, I would love it if I were to be able to open up an app, push a button, and a ride arrives. That's, that's, that's basically the whole, um, the whole experience boiled down to one, one, one sentence. But you open up your app, you get to see how many cars are around you, you push the button, you, you actually watch, you get to watch the car pull up as, as, uh, from wherever you are. Generally speaking, the big difference that you'll see is with the experience is you're gonna get a ride usually within four minutes, no matter what city you're in, no matter where you are in that city. Now that's a pretty drastic difference from you know, I'm a born and raised Calgarian. I've, I've you know, tried to call a taxi from Douglasdale and it's 45 minute wait and so on and so forth. But that's, that's a big difference. Um, so, so you get to watch the car drive up. You, you, you see the picture of the driver. Uh, you see their license plate number. Uh, as you get in the car, they take you where you need to go. One of the most magical experiences for me when I first took my, my first Uber in Boston was I got where I needed to go and I just left. So there was no like worrying about uh, hey, is there, uh, you know, do you have a debit machine in your car or anything like that? It was, you just leave because you've pre-registered your credit card ahead of time and then automatic payment just occurs. Um, and so this experience was really the base of why we're now in over 400 cities across the world. Um, now, part and parcel to this, a lot of people that haven't tried Uber, and I'm sure a lot of you maybe, let's say, two or three years ago that haven't tried Uber, when you first heard the idea, you might have thought, Oh, that sounds a little bit weird. Uh, I'm not sure about strangers driving around strangers. Mm -hmm. So we really had to build in trust into the system. So how did we do that? It really boils down to three areas during a trip. So before the trip, during the trip, and after the trip. There's a few things before the trip that we make sure that trust is always there. So things like, you know, we'll background check all our drivers to make sure there's no criminals and things like that on the system. We'll, 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 we'll check to see that, um, we'll, we'll check your dri the driver's driving history to make sure they're not speed demons going all over the place. We'll, we'll, um, we'll look at the, the vehicles to make sure they're, vehicle they're, they're inspected and they're safe cars. During, uh, during the trip, oh sorry, one, one other thing, when, before you uh, order a trip and you push the button, there's no anonymity in the system. So meaning, if, if you push the button, you get to see that driver's name, you see their picture, you see uh, their license plate number. On the other side, the drivers themselves actually see your name as well. And so when there's no anonymity in the system, what it does is actually disincense a lot of that bad behavior that can, can happen in these kind of situations. During the trip, every ride is GPS tracked. So I mean, you, know, you can watch where the car is going. A, a cool little feature that we've added is something called Share My ETA. So let's say it's late at night. You're a little bit worried about you know, getting into someone's car. You can, you can push the share my ETA button. You can send that to a friend or a family or a loved one. And they, w without having the Uber app, they can actually watch where your car is going as you're kind of taking that trip. Lastly, after the trip, what we've built in is actionable feedback. And so there's feedback and accountability right across the system. So what, what may be unbeknownst to a lot of people that have taken Uber here before is you take that trip and you get to rate that driver one out of five stars. The driver actually also rates you one out of five stars. And so what, what that essentially does is it keeps, it keeps the integrity of the platform high. So that you only get the best of both worlds, both riders and drivers. And so you, you literally only get the cream of the crop that keeps using the system. And so these are the kind of features that we made sure to put in so that people felt more trust with the system. And so now what you see is we're in over 400 cities and you know, Uber you hear about you know, almost on a weekly basis, but that, that's kind of the essence of what, uh, uh, what, what the Uber 101, for lack of a better term. Okay, thanks. So Peter, is this a viable model to improve the ability of people to earn a living? Yeah, so you know, I think we, we have some figures to show you some, uh, uh, to give you a sense of the viability of, of, of this model. Um, so first, uh, first model is, um, pardon me, first figure is the growth in drivers by, by US cities. And, and when you look at this figure, um, what, what's really striking is you see that for, you know, it's sort of in the early months of, so on, one, on the axis it shows you months and then it shows you the number of, of, of drivers. And what you see with this figure is that there's sort of 
gradual growth at first, and then as Ram had mentioned, there, there's a trust develops, a social acceptability, and then there's almost a, what, you know, what we call it like a social contagion effect where all of a sudden everybody starts using it. And then we see this, you know, it's reflected in the number of drivers by cities. So all of a sudden you see this sort of a spike in the number of drivers. So, you know, at one level this is telling us that, that, that there's folks who want to drive and there's demand for it out there. It takes a while, though, for a city uh, to, to warm up to Huber, but once it does, it really, it really goes. And, and to that yeah. perspective, what, what you do see is that, you know, of course, as, as you're launching newer cities now, that adoption curve starts moving a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, you know, I just asked the poll here. In a city where we don't have Uber right now, I'd say 80% of you guys put up, your, put up your hand saying, yes, I've taken an Uber before. So that social acceptance is there. Back in 2010 or 2011 or 2012, when we first started, there was a lot of um, perhaps apprehension, or it, it, the word of mouth wasn't necessarily there. And so now what you're seeing, and I, you know, I've suggested this, is you pull open your phone, you push a button, and you'll, you can get a ride. At the same time, now drivers are being able to do the same thing, where they can pull out their phone, push a button, now they get a job. And so it's, it's I, and we can get, well, I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later, but it's, it's the reason why people are finding this as a, a great option, not only for the rider side, but the driver side, is it's because of the flexibility. And it's, it's not like a traditional job. It's not like, you know, you gotta work eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, whatever may be the case. It's literally, okay, I can work for an hour here. I have an extra hour. I, I gotta pick up my kids at this time, but you know what, I'm gonna put in an hour. And so they can do that. And so it gives them that option to make a little bit of extra income while they're, um, you know, p potentially working full time on, on another job. And so uh, it looks like Miami was a little later in the game, so that's, yeah. that's why it, it spiked so much earlier? That's right, that's yeah. right. And so the Canadian cities actually would probably be on the left-hand side of the chart a little bit more. So you'd, you'd see Toronto, you'd see Edmonton, Calgary hopefully one day at some point in time. You'll see that kind of a growth spike um, really, really near the beginning. And so uh, what, what you expect to see is the adoption happens almost near immediate versus you wait you know, 10, 20 months after the fact. Okay, the second, uh, second figure we wanted to show you is the, at least looking at the U.S. growth in the number of, of, of Uber drivers. And, and what you see in this figure is that the, 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 the UberX, UberX really grows much more, uh, much more growth to it than the limousine service, which has some growth. But, you know, when, when I look at this figure, what it tells me is, you know, the real market is in, in, in the UberX. I mean, Absolutely, yeah. and, and, and the, the point here, what you, you will witness here is that it's largely because of the, the nature of the different businesses. So UberX, it's a licensed limousine model. It's, it's you know, these are full-time chauffeurs that, you know, through and through would continue to, to you know, work full-time, and this is what they would do for a living. UberX, I mean, the, the, the interesting thing is greater than 50% of UberX drivers drive less than 10 hours a week. So this is, these are situations where people might be you know, working their full-time job and say, hey, I'm going to drive for a few hours on Friday and Saturday night. And so as a result of that, now you get a lot more people that are looking to become drivers as UberX, but also on that is you get uh, a, a lot of folks that um, match a little bit more with the supply and demand. So meaning you see a lot of cars, let's say you know, with your traditional full-time models of taxi and limousines, you see a lot of cars that are out at, let's say, Thursday at 2 p.m. Because a lot of these full-timers, they, they like to work you know, 40, 50 hours a week, traditional hours during the day. And then at Friday or Saturday night at 2 a.m., there's not enough cars out. Whereas now, when you, when you have kind of a ride-sharing specific model, you don't get as many cars out during Thursday at 2 p.m. when it's not necessarily needed, but you get a lot more cars out at Friday and Saturday at 2 a.m. when people are actually looking for safe rides home. Um, so another one we show, you know, sort of who drives. We don't, we're not going to take you through the, you know, the, the meat of this. But when you look at this, it, what you'll see is when you look at from age 18 to uh, uh, 29 and 30 to 39, it's almost 50 percent of the Uber drivers. And you compare that to the taxi industry, and you see it's less than 30 percent. So this is a really youthful. Uh, a group of folks who are who are driving the cabs. 
The other thing uh, that uh, the, the, the demographics tell you is th this tends to, this is a highly educated group. Uh, almost 90% uh, have some post uh, high school education. Uh, and then when you compare that to um, cabs, it's, it's considerably lower. Um, even have 10.8% uh, postgraduate degrees. I was thinking of which degrees they are, probably philosophy, PhD in philosophy or something. <laughs> but uh, we won't go too far into that. <laughs> no MBAs, by the way. Um, so, you know, so very youthful, uh, highly educated group. Uh, uh, striking. So, you know, so then the question becomes, you know, on, on sustainability, what, what do Uber uh, drivers earn? And what this figure uh, shows us, um, if we look at uh, taxis versus Uber, in a city like New York, um, it's the difference between $30 versus $15 an hour. So those are substantial. Uh, also for San Francisco, Boston, um, it's a little bit less in DC, LA, and Chicago, but still a difference. We have to factor in a little, there's a little bit more cost on, on the, uh, for the Uber driver. Um, but it uh, looks like um, in, in a number of cities there's a sizable difference. Uh, Ron? Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, like, the, the big thing here is, as, as I mentioned, it, it really boils down to the efficiency that we try and build into the product. And so um, what this is driven by, and so I mentioned the fact that, you know, generally speaking, prices on Uber are 30 to 40 percent um, less expensive. Now, this seems to fly in the face of common sense when you actually see that earnings are higher. And it boils down to the efficiency. So meaning what a lot of people don't realize is um, you know, if you can actually pull down prices more, what that does is, of course, incent people to use, use ride sharing more often. And so what we're seeing in, in, in cities where we've been in for several years now, now it's really starting to shift, where behavior is really starting to change. And people are saying, you know what? I'm not even going to buy a car anymore. There's, there's no reason for me to buy a car. And I'm just going to use Uber, or I'm going to use uh, carpooling, or I'm going to use taxis, or I'm going to use uh, car to go, or bicycling, all these other modalities that are available to all of us. They use those things a lot more. And so what you find is, you know, although the, the fare on a per trip basis is lower, you get more trips. So as a driver sitting in that perspective, there's more, there's more time that you're actually getting paid rather than waiting for someone to come in and, and uh, waiting for the next trip. Yeah. And which is our next slide. So there, there's data from two cities where th there's, there's pretty good data from LA and Seattle where you can see capacity utilization rates, uh, basically defined as percentage of miles driven where you have a passenger, otherwise stated when you're making money. Um, and what you see in the case of LA is that roughly it's 65% of the time for Uber drivers versus about 40% of the time for uh, for cab drivers, so you know, m much more efficient. And similarly for Seattle, although is not as as striking. So a much you know much more efficient model on the driver side, and as we've talked about too on on the passenger side, much quicker to to getting the cab. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I I don't think I had anything more to say about that. One. Yeah, but you had that cool yes. graph. Exactly. So yeah. so th there's a few things that we uh, you know w when we're talking about when we're talking about um, you know, how, how, how has Uber really brought disruption into this industry? There's a few different things that, that we've, we've um, that I would consider as disruptive things. Number one, so I mentioned the efficiency. We, we, we um, make sure that pricing is right to, to incent more people to say, hey, I don't even want to own my own car anymore. There's a, f there's a few different things, though. So I, I mentioned the utilization. People get more rides uh, more quickly. As, as a driver, instead of, you know, your traditional taxi system where there's a dispatch system and there's a dispatcher who says, okay, I'm, uh, you know, there's a call coming in at 8 a.m., can you go pick it up? The technology is there and it automatically will pick the closest person to the person that's making the request. The second thing is surge pricing. And so you, you may have heard of surge or dynamic pricing and there's, it's, can come with a little bit of controversy. But we see it as a crucial part to ensure that it's as reliable as possible. And the reason is, is because uh, when you look at your traditional taxi system, you might think, well, you know, so I'll, I'll take my example. I used, to work, I used to live in Douglasdale. When I'd call, it would be maybe 45 minutes to get a taxi down there. Surge pricing really tries to 
uh, use the technology to really move uh, where the supply and the demand is. So meaning, I'll give you an example. Let's say a Flames game gets out. And the Saddle Dome, there's you know, 20,000 people coming on the streets looking for rides. Now, there's some people that might take the C train, some people that might take taxis. But quite frankly, there's, there's a bunch of people that are looking for rides. So they're opening up their app. When they're opening up their app, we know from our technology that there's a bunch of demand coming to that area. So if there's a bunch of demand, but there's not enough cars or drivers in that specific area, we might elevate pricing a little bit. What that does is that creates an incentive for drivers from around the city to go to that specific area. And it also incents more drivers to come on the platform to say, hey, I know I can earn a little bit more. It might make sense for me to sign on and, and, and earn. And so what, what you see is more drivers coming to a specific area. And that, once again, creates more reliability because now you're going to be able to get a ride within a few, few minutes, as, as is always the case. But beyond that is it creates that equilibrium between your supply and demand. So when people are looking for rides, if you're willing to pay a little bit more, you can, you can get a ride within a few minutes. If you don't want to pay more and you want to just stick to base pricing, you can just wait the extra few minutes until surge pricing goes down and drivers have come to that specific area. So surge pricing is one of those disruptive opportunities that we found has really changed how things work. Third piece is something we call Uber Pool. So Uber Pool is, is what, we're, what we're experimenting. Well, we're not experimenting. It, it's in quite a few cities right now. Uber Pool is really trying to bring carpooling, something that we've been talking since the 1970s about, and using technology to facilitate that as much as possible. And so I have a, a little animation. So basically how it works is, you know, instead of a situation, well, you know, I, I used to try and carpool when I, when I was going to, to University of Calgary here. And I had friends that, you know, we were trying to carpool together, and it just never really worked out. Our schedules didn't match up. I was late one day for 15 minutes because I was doing my hair. Uh, <laughs> or, 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 you know, he was late. Or, and, and so we just decided after a little while, you know what, we'll just, we'll just take our separate cars and forget this. What Uberpool does is it basically takes a situation where roughly in the same area, at the same time, someone is offering, someone wants to go to the same place, and it matches those people together. Now, what is the advantage of this? From, from a rider perspective, basically what it is, is it, um, it, it you know, you're sharing the, the cost of that trip. So it can be up to 50% cheaper. Uh, what we're seeing is adoption in cities like Toronto and San Francisco more than, you know, 20 to 30% of our trips in these, in these um, cities are Uber pool trips now. And um, you know, it's three factors. What we, we see early adoption with kind of younger people. Number one, because sure, they want to save money. Number two, it's a great environmental benefit. You know, now we're actually pooling people into the same trip rather than them taking two separate or three separate or four separate trips. Um, for, third thing is a social experience. You know, it, as odd as it is, in the bigger cities that we're living in, we're starting to get more and more or less, less uh, close to each other. And so this is an opportunity for people to talk to each other. From a driver perspective, this is a great opportunity for drivers as well. Because what you get is almost something called the perpetual trip, where people are coming in and going out and going in, but you're always getting paid no matter where you are going in the city. And so once again, this amps up that piece of Let's, we're, we're getting higher in uh, efficiency, which is getting a more guaranteed earnings for drivers. But on that same perspective, it's giving more opportunity for riders as they're getting around the cities. Uh, Uberpool is making a huge difference in the sense that you know, we've been in Toronto for more than six months with Uberpool. It's taken 3.4 million kilometers off of the road because of people pooling trips. This is, this, like, thinking about this to, uh, you know, in the long term is using Uberpool is, is one of those situations where people stop buying their own cars. Now, you know, it's our cars generally are our second most expensive asset that we own. And it sits idle 96% of the time. It sits in some parking lot. When you really think through this to the to the end point where people just say, you know what, I don't want to buy a car anymore. I'm going to use those options that are available to me that aren't necessarily personal cars, it really starts changing our cities where you can start transforming parking lots and all these things to green spaces and 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 parks. And so it really does make a difference. And so uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we can, we can get there with, uh, with Calgary very soon. So Peter, um, just at, we're going mm -hmm. to move to Q&A very mm -hmm. quickly here. But so after listening to this, what do you think these are the advantages? If you are a, 
a person in Calgary who thinks you want to be an Uber driver, we know the advantages mm -hmm. if you want to be a passenger, yep. but if you want to be a driver or let's say some other type of part-time employment where there's just in time. Yeah. So I mean, you know, so when you look at it, it, it looks to me like you're a young person, uh, you want to augment your income or you may not, you know, you may be a student and you, you want some income. Um, and uh, this becomes a viable, and you, and you have a car, your folks gave it to you, whoops. Um, but, uh, you know, you have a car, uh, as, you know, as Ramit said, it's, it's, it's essentially sitting idle. Um, you like technology, and uh, this is a viable way to make uh, some money. Um, uh, uh, there's other folks who would say, hey, I have a job, um, but I'd like to you know, get some uh, uh, presents for Christmas. Sounds like a good way to do it. Friday night, yeah, I, I'm, I'm willing to give up my Friday night to augment uh, my income uh, some. So the, the, these strike me as, as a sort of viable uh, folks who, who, would, who would use, uh, who the, would be drivers. The, yeah. the, the point on that is, um, What's been interesting, actually, if you look at the Alberta experience, so we've been in Edmonton for uh, close to two years now. We were operating in Calgary for six weeks last, last year. Um, what's interesting is if you take a ride in Alberta in an Uber, I'd say more often than not, so I'd even say probably 60 to 70% of the time, if you're talking to your Uber driver, they, they're more often than not, they're going to be geologists, engineers, geophysicists. These are all folks that work in the oil patch. And what they're using it for is... It's a bridge. So they're, they're looking for their next career. You know, the economy is the way that it is, but they're still able to support their family. So that, that's one use case. And the other use case is, as, as I suggested, the people that already have a full-time job. You see teachers that decide to drive during the summer. You see people that already have a full-time job and want to just get that incremental piece of income. Now, you know, an extra 1000 to, let's say, $10,000 a year may not seem like a lot, but it makes a huge difference to a lot of these families in the sense that this easily becomes something that you know, can pay for an extra vacation. This can pay for a special project like renovating the bathroom. Uh, there's, there's an interesting stat where 50% of Canadians have said that a, a, an extra $400 expense would actually put them under financial duress. So we're actually living paycheck to paycheck. And if that's the case, options like this or other shared, shared economy platforms really do make that difference in the sense that you know, now we don't have to live paycheck to paycheck and we have the opportunity to use the assets that we have to um, you know, get past that, that uh, wage st stagnation that we've seen for so many years that, that governments have been trying to figure out. And I, you know, I would just add a little bit, and you know, um, that part of the what makes the 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 the, the platform work is, is that y if you get a lot of people driving, the scale is important because that that reduces the time and so forth. That's exactly right. Yeah. So. And yeah. Um, just as we prepare for Q and A, I will put my two cents in on this. Mm -hmm. And the first time I heard Ramit, I thought this is more than taxis. So you need mm -hmm. a plumber. Your plumbing's just broken down. There's, you go on an app and how do you pull up a contractor immediately that's going to arrive to your house? You need childcare and you need it very quickly. How do you pull this up? So I can see the apps transcending over a lot of different types of work where there's just-in-time delivery required or some type of mathematical algorithm that allows you to build in the efficiencies to the system. So for me, I, that's where I've been thinking about what is that future impact on work and how do we pull together to, in a sense, improve the efficiency and use our assets better. And, and so there's several startups out there right now that are starting to do just this. So a, a few things, a few off the top of mind, of course, there's Airbnb that mi mo most of you have probably heard of. Airbnb, instead of renting a hotel, you can rent a room or a house from, from someone else, um, which is kind of that shared platform. But beyond that, there's a bunch of other kind of smaller but cool little startups coming out right now. So uh, there's one called Rover, where instead of you know, looking for a parking space on the street, you can rent a parking space from someone that happens to live close to there. Uh, there is something called Lending Club. This is, this is a fascinating one in the sense that it's, it's starting to, uh, it's using the shared platform against banks. So if you want to borrow money, 
uh, you know, you can get a, a bit of a lower interest rate if you go through Lending Club. And if you don't mind lending money, you'll get a higher interest rate than actually, uh, you know, putting it in a savings account. Uh, there's things like Turo, which I think has recently um, launched in Calgary, where if you want to rent a car, instead of renting through Avis or Budget or something like that, you can rent, uh, you know, a car from a neighbor. And so these are the opportunities that are out there, and I, you know, I'd implore everyone out there to think about these opportunities in your own industries as well. Uber is a big data company. Mm -hmm. It would boggle my mind if you didn't know the optimal vehicle for a driver to acquire to be an <laughs> optimal Uber driver. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, you're absolutely right. So a lot of the, I'd say 99% of those decisions that we make in regards to the business are all related to big data and they're based on the data that, that we have. So it's an interesting question because it depends on the product line. So I mentioned there's Uber X, which is kind of your standard, uh, you know, uh, typical ride sharing platform. There's all the way up to things like Uber Select, where it's more of a luxury experience. Generally speaking, if a driver comes up to us and asks us, hey, what would be a great car? We always optimize around saying, you know what's probably going to make the most sense is fuel economy. And so what you see in cities around the world, and it's probably less so in Alberta, just because there's less adoption of things like the Toyota Prius. But the Toyota Prius is, or, or the cars that just use less, less gas, those, those are generally your best bang for the buck cars. What about government, uh, governments and regulation? Mm -hmm. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think that's been an inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And you know, governments have created oligopolies in, in the cities and at airports. Mm -hmm. And what is the right level of, and fair, level of regulation that we should see for transportation in general? Yeah, so, so it's a great question. Um, so a few things, we're, we're working, we, you know, we're increasingly working very closely with governments around the world to create regulations that make sense. So admittedly, what, when we think about uh, regulations, and I've kind of gone through, you know, why we want to try and get as many drivers doing this as possible is because the more people that are driving, the less actual uh, absolute cars that you want to put on the road. And so what we try and do is we try and eliminate as many of the barriers to entry for someone becoming a driver as possible. And so from a regulatory standpoint, you know, we want the, the policy benefits that come to, to cities that, that Uber and other ride sharing platforms can bring. And so as much as we can uh, you know, decrease the barriers to entry, but still keep that level of trust high where safety is still there, where people say, okay, I feel safe getting in this car. I think that's the right balance. Now, as we're, as we are, um, you know, working closer and closer with governments around the world, like, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating to think there's, there's some cities in the U.S. where we're partnering with the transit agencies, meaning, um, you know, there's transit agencies that have said, okay, we will work actively with Uber in the sense that, you know, if, if I take the train to my last stop and my bus isn't going to show up for the next 30 or 45 minutes, I can take an Uber and the transit agency will subsidize a part, part of that, uh, that ride to you. And so we, we, we work very closely in that kind of, for transit agencies in that first mile and last mile relationship where it's like help, and so we want to work complementary to a transit agencies, but beyond that, I mean, really what we want to do is bring down barriers so that we can get as many people participating in the platform as possible. I mean, I, you know, first point, uh, you know, what Raman said, it, it, this whole, what I'll call the paratransit or this, this kind of variable route, um, you know, where you don't, where is in fixed point is an important part of the, the in, in my mind, the transit system, and sometimes we lose sight of that. Um, it, you, know, I, you know, I think it's a little tricky. Like, I think a, a lot of cities are, are, are sort of struggling of how to, you know, uh, I won't say maintain the taxi system, but um, you know keep the taxi system, and um, and but yet move forward uh, with the reality that this is here with us. You know, in a lot of these cities, uh, like New York City, for example, you know you paid a fortune for a medallion. Yeah, it was on a gray market, but that was imposed on those people, and those medallions have really uh, lost value. So I think you know you have to find ways to reconcile the system. It, it, it looks to me like there's, there's space for both players. Um, although taxis won't be, a, 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 it's clearly not gonna be a growth industry. Yeah, and, yeah. and to that point, like yeah. we, we, what's interesting is, is you'd never really hear us talk about the taxi market as a market that you know, we find attractive. What we find much more attractive is 
our, our total addressable market is really getting people out of single occupancy vehicles. And so we, do, we actually don't think it's a zero sum game where if, you know, trips are being taken away from taxi, they're going to Uber and there's only a cap level. What we've seen in city after city after city after city is once you make, uh, once you make the experience more convenient, more affordable, more reliable, all of a sudden people start ditching their cars more and going out more. And so what that does is it actually uh, increases the sea level for all of the, all of the transportation providers, whether that be taxi or a car to go or um, other other option or mass transit, other options that are available to you. Yeah. So can I just add, I think in answer to your question, I think the other times you need regulation is when there's information asymmetry and you're trying to protect the person who has the least information. And as I was looking at the shared platforms, what it's doing is reducing information asymmetry through technology. And so you need less regulation if you have more sharing of information when you look at these apps. And so that would also be, I think there should be less need for government regulation once yeah. you drop that. Yeah, and, um, I, yeah and, I, and I would add to that. I mean, you know, the way, kind of the way I, I conceive of this is that essentially what Uber does and other firms like this is they act as brokers. Um, brokers between passengers and, and drivers. And to the degree that you can create this transparency, you can create a, a, a more honest uh, broker. Uh, I think that's, the, that's a, another way of kind of conceptualizing Absolutely. it. Yeah. Uh, we know that the demand and, and the need is only going to skyrocket for our seniors, clients, and, and people living with disabilities and so on for transportation uh, over the next couple of decades. Uh, I'm aware that Uber and Lyft and, and others are partnering with health services, senior serving agencies, and so forth in other parts of North America. Is that something you're looking at uh, here potentially in Alberta? And if so, I'd love to talk to you after. Um, and as well, we're we're also curious about the potential impact uh, for self-driving cars uh, with, with our populations that we serve. And so just curious about your thoughts on that uh, in terms of impact on your workforce. Sure. Thanks. So so from a demographics perspective, from a rider base, in any city that you go in, what you first see are the early adopters that use the product. So it's, it's generally younger people that, um, you know, have basically grown up with a smartphone attached to their head. And it's also business travels. Now, that's usually your first set of adopters. As we continue to grow in a city, what you see is those demographics continue to spread out, and it starts looking more like the general population. What's fascinating now is, right across the world, our fastest growing demographic is with seniors, simply because there's, there's things that we'll do. So meaning, you know, when we've tried to simplify the process, so you just push a button, Car comes and shows up. That's a pretty simple process for a lot of a lot of seniors to, to go through. And further to that, the transparency in the process and the accountability that's there, they're left in a little bit better of a, a mindset of okay, I I don't think I got ripped off, or I don't I don't feel like that was a poor experience. And so that's continuing to be a great focus for us. And quite frankly, in Alberta, that's that's going to be a, a huge growth area. Um, so would love to talk to you about that, that after. Uh, autonomous vehicles. So uh, some of you may have heard we've been doing some testing in Pittsburgh uh, about a month ago, and so that, that's continuing on, where there's actually autonomous vehicles taking Uber rides for the first time. Now, we still have safety drivers or safety operators there behind the wheel just in case things go wrong, two, two engineers kind of behind each car just to ensure that the testing goes right. The benefits of autonomous vehicles can't be understated in any shape, way, or form. There's a few things that autonomous will do for the world. So there's roughly about 1.3 million people that die globally from automobile-related uh, accidents. If autonomous vehicles were to be widespread adopted, that goes down by 95%. That, that's a huge impact. It, it actually, you know, that would be more impact than a lot of, you know, curing diseases that are out there on a yearly basis in terms of lives saved. Beyond that, what you, what you see is traffic essentially goes away. So there was an OECD report that recently said that if there was widespread shareable autonomous vehicles out there, traffic would be reduced by 90%. And so it's, it's an area that we're testing. We, it's definitely going to be the future. From a policy perspective for governments out there, this is, this is a, you know, of huge benefit. Um, I still think it's going to be quite a few years away, just, just um, you know, 
given, given the technology needs to catch up, given the infrastructure needs to get there, given the regulatory models still need to get figured out. But that's definitely an area where um, there's going to be um, big changes coming uh, in terms of um, how cities plan roads and traffic and all that good stuff. Should we be concerned about Uber becoming kind of a monopoly platform over the medium term? And just a few examples about what I mean about that. In China, you sold off your operations to DD, so there's now kind of one ride-sharing service there. I mean, Uber's lost a lot of money over the first uh, two quarters of 2016. So has your competitor Lyft. So there's clearly a race to become the dominant platform as you subsidize per trip rides. Um, you know, long term, uh, passengers are going to flock to the app that offers the fastest service, mm -hmm. and so too will drivers. So you can see some network monopoly potential there through the apps. And then once you have a monopoly, you can charge monopoly prices to both the passenger and to the driver. So kind of a question about sure. long term, and maybe I won't throw it to Ramit, I'll throw it to the uh, researcher just to kind of see if, if that's a worry. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, um, I mean, you know, obviously possible, um, you know, and, and Ramit, I'd ask you this question. Potentially, a driver could drive for two different companies I, at the I, same time. Absolutely. So, yeah. so we actually, whenever we're thinking about ride, ride share, competing ride sharing platforms, we've nev we, nev we don't ever restrict uh, partners from only saying you have to drive with Uber, but they, they're open to driving on any or all platforms that are out there. But but beyond that, I mean, like from from a you know we're we're absolutely investing uh, to to ensure that you know we can grow as 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 uh, as much as we can, and so that's where you see some of uh, the, those reports coming from. The, the reality is, is as as I've suggested before, we want to try and make the barriers so that people can drive as low as possible. As you kind of push those barriers down, it actually makes it easier for competitors to come into the system because now, hey, I can I can get a whole bunch of drivers very easily, and we're okay with that. But what you know, we we do see competition as a actually a great thing for both riders and drivers. From a rider perspective, rides get cheaper for people that want to get around their cities. From a driver perspective, they get paid more for driving as they are, and so you know we're continuing to invest. The, the reality is is that you know. From a margin perspective, we're, we're much more of like a volume type of a business. It's, it's closer to an Amazon-like model where we're a middleman or a broker uh, versus the Google model where it's you know, very high margins on, on uh, advertising. So I mean, um, for, for, from that perspective, I mean, we're going to continue to see things grow. But really, we, we don't try and say, hey, you're, gonna be, you're, you can, you're subservient to Uber and you can only drive with Uber. We leave it wide open for anyone to drive with whoever they want. And if they just happen to get more rides with Uber, that's, that's a positive for them and riders. Yeah. But I mean, to your point, though, scale matters here. You know, so certainly, you know, my expectation would be we'll see two, two players, two, three players in, in a market at, at maximum. Yeah, could, yeah. It could, could be, yeah. could be. Is there one last question in the audience? Yeah. Okay. Just, uh, we're an energy city, and mm -hmm. uh, from the point of view of energy demand, has anybody done any work on mm -hmm. whether uh, these shared platforms will decrease the demand for energy, uh, oil and gas, uh, electricity, et cetera? And I thought water, too. And water, yeah. Mm. So I, I mean, fr from uh, from Uber's perspective, I don't think we've done any specific studies to that point. What what we, you know, what we do want to do more than anything else is is change cities and how they live. And so from that perspective, if um, you know, if we're actually getting people to use their own personal cars less, we see that as a win. Um, that potentially could have impacts on energy, but from from that perspective, um, you know. I'm, I'm assuming there's going to be a whole bunch of other externalities that are happening as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but certainly you'd think it would be a reduction in, 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 in use of gasoline over time. Yeah. Thank you.